Welcome to Cranfield University. You're in the right place if you want to find out more about retail and digital banking. Thank you for joining us. I know you've got busy days ahead. I'm joined today and for the next hour by two special guests and we're really pleased to welcome Katerina Figuera into the studio again. It's great to have you with us. More from Katerina in a second. We're also joined by someone from the Apprenticeships Office here at Cranfield University, Christina Goodman. And Christina, it's good to have you with us. So more from you uh, very shortly too. So you're in the right place to find out more about the Apprenticeship Levy and the Retail and Digital Banking MSc and the Retail and Digital Banking MSc Apprenticeship version. So if you're in the wrong place, welcome anyway. <laughs> I'm going to turn now to uh, Katerina. Katerina, thank you again for joining us. Your professor, Katerina Figuera, and you're in the, have I got this right, the Cranfield Economics and Banking Group. Say a bit more about yourself. Yes, so I'm Professor of Applied Economics and Policy at uh, Cranfield School of Management. Um, and uh, I'm also the director of uh, the MSc in Retail and, uh, and Digital Banking, which is one of the programs that we deliver in uh, uh, the Economics and Banking Group, which also sits in, uh, within the Economics and, and Finance Center at the School of Management, at Cranfield School of Management. Wonderful. So everyone on the call that uh, are thinking of coming on this course, they will see you. Uh, yes, of course, because I teach on the program. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. So any questions that you may have, Katerina is the person to Of ask. course, and, and that's why I'm here. So um, I, I really welcome any questions that people have. Um, I, I will go through, uh, you know, a, a short introduction as well to the program, but, uh, you know, feel free to ask any questions that, uh, uh, that you have about the program. And uh, the apprenticeship, and, and Christina is also here to... Um, uh, to join us and to clarify any any points that people may have in terms of of the apprenticeship. Brilliant. So we're looking forward to welcoming you to Cranfield as and when you choose uh, the course. Hope, hopefully that you will. Let's start then. You've got some slides. Can you explain a bit more about the School of Management then and where the whole thing sits? Okay. So um, in terms of the School of Management, I, I have a few slides okay. in terms Let's of, um, of that. So perhaps I can just provide a, an overview uh, of Cranfield University and the School of Management for those that perhaps uh, are not so familiar with, uh, with the university and, uh, and our School of Management. Um, now, uh, Cranfield University is an exclusively uh, postgraduate uh, university. So we deliver, at Cranfield, we deliver um, programs at a master's level, at a doctoral level, and also a lot of uh, executive education. And some of, of course, the, the programs that we deliver are linked to um, apprenticeships, so level seven type of apprenticeships. Uh, Cranfield is well known for uh, creating uh, leaders both in technology and management, and within management, of course, um, we are also well known for, um, uh, you know, for training and developing uh, bankers. Um, and we've been running, for instance, this MSc in Retail and Digital Banking now for a number of years. Um, now, with respect um, to, uh, uh, to the School of Management, um, we are uh, triple accredited, so we are um, part of a, a small group of... Um, of business schools that um, is accredited by um, the American um, body of accreditation, which is known as the AACSB, also the European uh, body of accreditation of business schools, which is uh, EQUIS, and also uh, with respect to uh, the UK, we also have a, a body of accreditation that is specific to the, the MBA programs, and that's AMBA. So we are triple accredited. Um, as a business school, um, I'm sure that many people will know that we've been very successful over the years. We have a number of programs that consistently uh, rank uh, in the top 10 uh, in the UK. And, um, and so among those are, for instance, the MSc in Management, the MSc in Strategic um, uh, marketing as well, uh, MSc Finance and, and Management. And a lot of these programs actually, um, they, um, 
they, they have served as a, as a basis, some of its content for then the creation of our masters in retail and digital banking, which uh, derives a lot from some of the, the disciplines that we have in, in these other MSEs. Um, in terms of, uh, of our uh, alumni network, we are worldwide, we have more than 70,000 um, alumni spread over you know, the many continents that you see there. And, um, and we are present, or we have alumni, let's say, in um, around 170 countries uh, in the world um, which is, you know, great. It's a great opportunity for us then to run many alumni events every year. We have over 60 every year. And we also have around 30 international communities. Um, so, so really that demonstrates uh, the fact that once people come to Cranfield, there is then this lifelong relationship uh, with the university and, uh, and of course with the School of Management. In terms of our clients and if I think about our corporate relationships, uh, we over the years we've had uh, um, you know programs that we've delivered to uh, many of our corporate clients. You can see um, some of them there and, um, and also on this slide and, and of course among them we have as well, you will have seen from, from these two slides, um, a lot of uh, uh, banking organizations. So that's a little bit in terms of um, Cranfield University and the School of Management, very briefly. Um, with, uh, with respect to the MS in Retail and Digital Banking, this is of course uh, an executive part-time uh, program, which is also linked um, to um, a, an apprenticeship standard, which is the senior commercial uh, or investment banking professional um, apprenticeship standard. Uh, so there is uh, the opportunity for individuals either to do this MSc as a standard MSc or to do it as an apprenticeship program. Um, this program is accredited by the chartered banker and what that means is that upon successful completion of the program, um, each individual uh, will also be uh, awarded um, full charter banker status and they will get their charter banker diploma. So not only they get an academic uh, qualification uh, as a result of um, uh, carrying out, you know, undertaking the program, but they also get a, a professional qualification. And the Charter Banker uh, Institute is a very large um, institute, very well known in the UK and present again in more than 100 countries uh, around the world with, um, I believe, more than 80,000 um, members as well. So. Um, I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to have both an academic and, uh, and uh, a professional qualification from two very um, reputable organizations. Um, with respect um, to um, the, the, the prime audience for the retail and digital banking, um, so, so this program is really geared towards those individuals that either work in the banking industry or work with, for instance, clients in the banking industry. So, for instance, in consultancy or provide services to, to, the, banking, um, to the banking industry, to different uh, types of, of, of banks. Um, a lot of people would ask me, okay, so um, in order to, to come and do this MSc, uh, what should my background be, uh, you know, in? And I would say that um, there are two main types of people that tend to come to the program. Uh, one is those individuals that have perhaps a, a, a background in, um, um, in, in finance and uh, quantitative analysis, but actually they want to be exposed more to other areas 
of, uh, of banking and, uh, and digital provision of, of services. Um, and then there are those individuals that actually may not have um, a financial background, but they want to have a, a better understanding of certain functions relating again to, to finance. So really to have like a deep dive into, uh, into finance and other areas uh, in banking, which again, uh, they may not have been exposed because uh, you know, people who are in banking or who deal with banks, they often deal with certain areas within banking. And within banking, you have areas, you know, you have functions relating to product management, product development, could be marketing, could be finance, accounting. So there are a, a vast amount of areas within banking. Doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will know about all and and will have been exposed to all these different areas of banking. So really this program enables people to have that exposure across uh, the different functions and, and the different areas in, uh, in retail and also digital banking, of course, because digital banking has become uh, very much embedded in, uh, in what banking is nowadays. Um, with respect to the program structure, you will see there from um, the slide that this MSC really brings together, let's say, three main areas, which are about uh, retail and specifically, um, you know, retail within, within banking. Uh, so I would say this is not a program about, for instance, investment banking. It's very much around retail. Um, it's also about uh, digital business. So having a better understanding of um, the, uh, the challenges, the opportunities that digital business uh, and digital provision offers nowadays. And then of course also um, having that, you know, developing their knowledge, their, their skills, their behaviors with respect to more widely finance and, and, and management. And you can see from the list of modules, there are 12 modules that um, all the individuals will need to undertake. They are divided into two years there. So year one and year two. Um, one of the modules, which is the uh, retail uh, banking and product management is actually a, a double module. Um, and towards the end of uh, the second year, the students also need um, to undertake uh, an in-company uh, project. So it's a project that should primarily be based on um, a, an issue, a problem, or an opportunity that, ha that the individual and or the organization may have identified as important for, uh, for the business. And so then um, the learner will work on, uh, on on developing uh, that particular uh, project uh, with a view, um, with a view of coming up with some recommendations at the end for for the organisation, and in the meantime, that also will enable the individual uh, to develop um, a relatively, um, you know, uh, quite a considerable, I would say, uh, set of um, uh, of skills. Uh, as part of, uh, of that project as well. Um, so, so really, uh, the, the MSc in Retail and Digital Banking is very succinctly, it's, it's about bringing together um, the, the most up-to-date um, knowledge in, um, in banking and also uh, from, a, from an academic perspective, but also and very importantly, in applying all the, um, the theories, the frameworks, the, the, toolki the toolkits that we will provide you throughout the MSc and apply them um, sometimes almost uh, immediately to the workplace. Uh, there's a question from Luke. Oh, um, Luke, thank yes. you for your question. Would business and corporate banking be included within the scope of retail banking? Would business and corporate business stroke corporate banking be included within the scope of retail banking? Um, well, um, it's, it's actually an interesting question <laughs> because, well 
because we've just had, um, I think three weeks ago, as part of retail banking and product management, as part of that module, we actually had a session where we focused uh, more about corporate banking, but corporate banking, we tend to, I mean, it tends to come under commercial uh, banking. And so I would say is not really central to this program. So there are many, um, of course, many areas that we cover in this program that, of course, are applicable to corporate banking as well. Um, but it's primarily focused on retail and I would say uh, small business and um, private banking as well, rather than focusing on, on corporate banking. Okay, thank you. And Luke, if you want to come back, please just type something into the text chat. Does, did that answer back. your question, Luke? <laughs> yeah, Luke, does it answer your question? Just let us know in the text chat. Thank you, yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Luke, thank you. As Luke has taken the plunge there, please, anyone else, uh, a question at any time around any aspects of the, that you see here. I do have another question around the relevance of this course. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to come on to that in your slides, but how and why is this relevant? How does it stay relevant? Who, do you, who are you talking to to make sure that you're bang up to date with the latest? Okay, so, um, and, and that's a very important question, and that's something that has always been, um, you know, at the center of, first of all, the development of the program, and then um, the, you know, the current updates, let's say, with respect to this program. Uh, so the program was actually developed initially with one bank, and it was um, developed to really to, to meet the needs of, of that bank and more widely of the banking industry. And then after that, we started having discussions with other banks. And, and so it's important for me to have very, very, very regular discussions with, uh, uh, with senior bankers and with you know, different banks within, within the UK and abroad to make sure that we cover all the relevant areas that are you know, required for, for bankers and for the banking institutions. And, um, and that is more important than ever. I mean, if we look, for instance, at the, um, uh, so there was a report on financial services um, skills and, uh, and the needs, the challenges and the opportunities uh, to retain, um, to the retained workforce in the financial industry. Uh, this was published uh, in 2020 and it was commissioned actually by the then cha uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, this MSc was actually seen as, um, as a, a, an exemplar of uh, a, a master's that and an apprenticeship that actually um, can enable individuals in the banking industry to uh, to develop, to meet the challenges of, of the industry, um, and also for banks to retain the talent that they have. So, uh, so really, we, you know, that really attests for the, the, relevance, the relevance of this program. Brilliant. And I would, I would go further in the sense that we have a lot of guest speakers from different banks and, and also consultancies that uh, come to and, and they deal with banks and they come to talk to uh, our learners. So for instance, just um, a few weeks ago, we had a team of people from um, senior management at HSBC that uh, came and talked to our students. We've also had, um, I mean, next Monday, we have the, the head of uh, risk management at Metro Bank wow. that is also going to deliver a session for our students. Um, just a week ago, we had um, a team from for Frontier Economics talking about uh, pricing in, the, uh, in, in banking and, and banking products and, and services. So it's a very, um, I mean, it's a very engaging MSc and, and also we really welcome the contribution from, from practitioners because I think that's the best way to stay relevant and and to know what are the, the next few challenges that banks face. That's great to hear. Thank you for that. Uh, before you go back to your PowerPoint slides, uh, Sabello has a question yes, sure. on disruption. To what extent does the program focus on disruption, on traditional banking, 
specifically aspects around fintech that look at open banking, for example. Yes. Oh, yes, for sure. Uh, uh, you know, all those areas are very topical. We have one of the, the, the modules that we have is very specific on digital banking. So things like open banking, of course, are, are very much, um, you know, uh, central uh, to that module but they permeate in, in most of the modules because whether we are talking about uh, you know, digital banking per se or whether we are talking about uh, a new product and service development or, um, or a project and program management, of course you always have to bear in mind now these, these new challenges and new opportunities that for instance open banking offer. So, so yes, for sure, it's, it's very much part of the, of the curriculum. So, Bello, thank you for your question. And if you haven't asked a question yet, please get into the text chat and type something away. I'll let you get back to your slides because I think you're going to tell us more about um, possibly around progression, career progression, where people head once they've done this course. Yes, yes. So um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit more in terms of the content and then, um, and then I can speak a little bit as well of um, um, you know, what's next for people that um, undertake the, this program. So, so in essence, um, uh, with respect to the structure of the retail and digital banking, uh, we have the equivalent of 14 days per year. Um, and what I mean by 14 days is that um, individuals will have uh, basically every other uh, Monday in most cases, every other Monday, they'll have four hours, so half a day of sessions. So that if we, uh, you know, put all of that together, that's the equivalent of around uh, 14 days. And that includes also the registration, the, um, the induction uh, day, and the, the final project presentation. So the in-company project that individuals have to do at the end of the, um, um, of the program, towards the end of the program. Um, each session runs for four hours and, and so it runs on a, a Monday, okay? Um, each module will have the equivalent of 16 contact hours with another four hours uh, equivalent of supporting a synchronous type of, of learning. So I would like to um, clarify here that this program, the delivery, the delivery is synchronous. Um, however, you also have some supporting material uh, which would be asynchronous, okay, with each module. Um, in terms of time commitment, a lot of people uh, ask me, okay, so how much time do I have to allocate to this program? Obviously, um, you have to be present at every session independently of whether it is online or not, because, you know, um, a lot of the learning takes place as a, re uh, as a result of, people, of people's engagement and sharing their experience uh, of, you know, their experience, their challenges in the workplace so that we can really have fruitful discussions. Um, Depending on whether you have, say, a background in, in marketing or a background in accounting, there will be some modules that you'll find easier than others, obviously. And so with some modules, you will need to spend more time preparing for those modules and, and preparing for the assessment than with others. So it's, it's really difficult to say how much uh, time you need to commit. However, if you decide and if you are uh, supported by your employer to do this program as part of an apprenticeship, then for sure you will need to have at least 20% of the job uh, training, okay? Um, the other thing I would say which is really important when it comes to uh, the learning process is that um, with this program, as with, by the way, almost every program at Cranfield, we have learning teams. That is, every individual will be allocated to a small group of between four and six individuals, which, you know, we normally uh, call learning teams, who may come from, uh, you know, who may have different backgrounds, who may 
uh, come from different functions within different banks, uh, for instance. And the idea is, is for people to actually bring different perspectives um, to discussions within the small group and to help each other when it comes to uh, assessments, to uh, preparing for presentations. And we really want to encourage people to get out of their comfort zone and have really uh, useful discussions and get different perspectives from individuals that are in, in other parts perhaps of, of organizations. Um, uh, the, the other point that I have on this slide is about assessments because that's one thing that people um, ask me a lot. Um, so you tend to have one assessment per module and with respect um, to the nature of assessments, they tend to be a combination of individual and group projects and of course uh, some presentations as well and then you have a large in-company project at the end that you, you need to submit as well. Um, so what's special about, about our program? Well, um, I mean, you see their personal development is really core um, to this program. So we want individuals to, uh, to develop their knowledge, their, their skills as as responsible bankers that really value um, sustain the, the, the importance of sustainability uh, in, uh, in organizations and in this case in particular in the banking industry because of course we know that the banking industry plays such uh, an important role uh, in, in supporting different, um, different sectors as well of, of the economy. Uh, we want to help people uh, develop some, you know, analytical skills for those that already don't have it. Some people may work in banks, but actually uh, they want to develop their digital skills as well. So that's also uh, core to, uh, to the program. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, there, there are areas around um, communication, presentation skills, working uh, efficiently, effectively uh, with teams that is really important um, in this program. Um, I always say that no one can actually finish this program unless they work with teams. So we believe that, you know, uh, uh, an efficient banker, an efficient manager, um, cannot be so for very long unless they are surrounded by also really e efficient teams. So that's really important. That sounds realistic as well in yes. terms of the world of work. Uh, Sabella has another question. You mentioned uh, company, uh, sorry, um, yeah, company projects. Does the company project replace the paper or the thesis? Is there a paper and a thesis that people have to write? Uh, yes, so, so actually uh, the company project is the thesis, ah, right. okay? So, um, so the company project needs to meet the requirements of an academic thesis, yes? But it also needs to meet the requirements of the company. So it needs to be relevant for the organization. There needs to be, um, no, it's not just about, okay, and now I'm going to write a thesis <laughs> about banking. No, there needs to be the identification of an important issue that the bank may have or a great opportunity to develop maybe a new product or a new service or, or uh, potentially to target a new market or a new segment and that needs to be developed carefully and, and it needs to be well grounded of course in, in literature, in research that um, the, the learner needs to do so that at the end of the day on the basis of all the data that uh, will have been collected, all the research that the learner will have done, they can provide some robust recommendations that the, the business then will say, right, these are great recommendations, now let's implement them. So Sabello, it sounds like the business needs to benefit from the, the project as, oh, much as, sure. as much as the course. Yes. Uh, please come back with any more questions. Oh, actually, Isabella, are you okay to have a follow-on? Yes, on? of course. Isabella yes, has yes. a follow-on. In your opinion, 
uh, if one has been in retail banking for 10 years, let's say, and working in innovation, and then further that has switched over to fintech, let's say five years, um, specifically focusing alternate fan financing models on open banking, is this program beneficial? But yes, a career advice there, so good. Yes, well of done, course. So, so that perhaps leads me to what you were asking before, <laughs> <Fantastic>. <laughs> Toby, about where do people go from yes. here? Okay. So we've had a variety of um, of different alternative uh, outcomes. Let's say with the with this with the MSc, we have those individuals that actually have been for ten or, or twenty years in banking and will remain in banking, but have uh, been promoted, a large majority of, of the individuals that have been on this program have been promoted or they have found positions elsewhere. As a result of this program? As a result of this wow. program, I would say. So, and, um, and s some of them in, f in the fintech industry, yes, for sure, for sure. So I have a number of, of, um, of previous students and, and a few current ones that actually have moved on to fintech because uh, of the great opportunities as well that, uh, that they offer. Um, and so, so that is one area. Um, there are uh, in, uh, individuals that, you know, we have a range of some um, more junior individuals um, that are accelerating their career a lot faster as a result of, uh, of this MSE. And also we have some individuals that um, have been in the banking industry for a very long time and, and some of them, you know, they may have joined the banking industry when they were 16, so they didn't do a first degree, but yet they have vast amount of experience in the banking sector and some of them actually have very senior roles, but they want to have that uh, seal of approval in terms of their, um, you know, their, their education uh, qualifications and and also it gives them the opportunity to really then you know take yet another another leap Brilliant. because of course uh, you know an academic qualification is is also so important so it's really a combination but for sure we are seeing a lot of people particularly those that move from banks also moving to uh, to fintechs. Sabello I love that question please if you're if, as bold as Sabello and you want to ask about your particular career, please type it into the text mm. chat. Uh, don't share anything you don't need to share. In fact, I would say that if Isabella looks into, um, uh, for instance, some of the press releases from some of the banks, they will, she will see that, you know, it has been really successful in terms of, you know, promotion, for instance, um, among certain banks. So many, so, so much of the talent that comes onto the program then has these great opportunities for development. Impressive. Please mm. type in those questions. You have some more slides by the sound of it. You, you, uh, yeah. Yes, let's, let's move on. I'll just skip that one. So um, just a few other things with respect to the program and, and the kind of facilities we have to support the program. So at the School of Management, uh, we have what we call the MERC, which is our Management Information Resource Center, which is uh, it's like a, let's say a smaller library that is very specific uh, to the needs of, of the students and and uh, uh, and our learners uh, in the School of Management. And as um, as part of that service that we offer, we also have an individual, a librarian that is specifically allocated to this program. So. Uh, she knows exactly what our uh, learners are looking for, which, which I think it's, uh, it's really important uh, when you are someone that is busy, is doing this program uh, uh, on a part-time basis, and you, know, you also have uh, uh, your career, of course, and your life outside the program. Mm. So it's really useful to have someone that understands what needs you have as part of uh, of the, the learning that is required on, on this program. Um, and then just very briefly also to mention a few details. So the start date for the program, uh, the next intake is the 19th of September. Um, so as I mentioned previously, uh, the program runs uh, for two years and, um, and the delivery. So we have those 12 modules that are delivered and that, uh, you know, they, they constitute the equivalent of around 65% of, um, of the program and the other 35% is allocated to the 
in company uh, project. Um, with respect to the location, I would say this is a blended program, so it will be primarily delivered online, so a syn synchronous delivery. Um, however, there will be a couple of uh, touch points, you know, um, sessions that will run at Cranfield because uh, we also believe that it is important for people once in a while to meet the other learners on the program face to face and to meet faculty uh, because, you know, you get a different type of experience if you engage individuals, even if they are from the same organization, but in many cases you have organi organizations that have thousands of individuals and you may not have met uh, some of your colleagues before. So, um, you know, our, our um, uh, learners in previous cohorts, they have really welcomed also uh, those few opportunities to come to Cranfield for, for a few sessions. Um, so, I would also like to stress, you know, the fact that there are two qualifications as a result of this, uh, of this MSc. So, you get the academic qualification, which is the MSc in Retail and Digital Banking, but you also get the Charter Banker Diploma and full Charter Banker status if you complete the program uh, successfully. Um, I mentioned a little bit in terms of the qualifying criteria before, uh, in the sense that I talked a little bit about those individuals that perhaps don't have a first degree, uh, but they may have vast amount of, uh, of um, experience in the banking industry, and we have a few of those that have come onto the program. Actually, I would say around 20% of our um, uh, learners in retail banking um, don't have a first degree. And the reason for that is because with retail banking, a lot of people come as, you know, junior members of staff into, you know, sometimes uh, branches within a bank, and then they move up in the organization. And in many cases, they, uh, they go through some internal training, and that's how they move up. So if you can demonstrate that you may not have a first degree, but that you have that solid um, career path and, and knowledge that you have accumulated over the years, then um, we would very much welcome a discussion with you. Uh, otherwise, of course, the majority of our students um, are degree qualified um, and, um, and they don't have to have a first degree in finance or accounting. So that's just one of the areas of, um, of retail banking. But of course, other people, they may be in customer service or they may be in marketing or they may be in HR and therefore they may come with uh, very different qualifications and, and they are welcome because, uh, you know, a great part of the program is really to provide exposure to different areas within, uh, within retail banking. You're talking about qualifying criteria there. Mm. Sabello has another question. Yes, uh, sure. Is there a GMAT or a GRE requirement for the program? And if one already holds an MBA, would this be required? if five years have elapsed since you wrote that GMAT? Um, no, a GMAT is not required. So we will look at uh, all your qualifications, training, if you've done any training internally. Uh, it would be good if you could provide us also those details. Um, with respect to the MBA, we have a number of individuals that over the years they, they've registered and they've undertaken the, the program and they had an MBA. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, relatively common as well in terms of the, uh, the participants of, um, of this MSc. A follow-on question. Uh, Sabella, you're doing really well here, so well done. Um, also, would one be able to do their in-company projects globally? Because as a part-time program, work permit issues becoming an issue with the UK, would it be possible to thus recommend a project in home countries? Can it be a global project? Um, yes, of course, of course, it, it, could, uh, it could very well be. And I would say, I mean, I don't know in the case of Isabella whether she would be looking for uh, the program as part of an apprenticeship or not. If it's not as part of an apprenticeship, then it could be, you know, from wherever in the world, or it could certainly be a, a project, a global project that uh, impacts uh, on different areas of, of say the bank uh, or whichever organization that may 
you know, liaise with banks, of course, um, around the world. It, that's fine. That's fine. It may cover another country or several other countries. Uh, that's perfectly fine. But it can also be, and I have several, actually several individuals at the moment working for uh, different banks where those banks are actually, you know, global banks, international banks, and I'm sure you will see uh, some of them on our uh, website. And, and therefore, a lot of their projects don't have just a UK remit because, you know, they are international. So whatever they are doing is relevant, not just for the UK, but, uh, you know, to other markets um, that the bank operates in. So that's fine. Um, there's another question, but I might leave that until the a more formal Q&A at the end. I felt you were going to come on to apprenticeships there, but please carry on with your, your slides. Uh, yes. I, I mean, I would say, uh, I think the, um, the audience, they will all get these slides, don't yes, they, as yes. part of the presentation. So um, I will just um, finish perhaps my part of the, of the presentation by saying that we are really proud that at Cranfield we have a lot of firsts. So we've been the first university provider of master's levels apprenticeships. Um, we've been the first um, business school to, de to deliver um, the senior leader apprenticeship. And of course, I'm incredibly proud as well that we are the first business school to deliver uh, the senior banking professional uh, postgraduate apprenticeship program, which is the one we are talking about today. And having said that, I will <laughs> just uh, uh, pass it on to my colleague Christina, who is going to talk a little bit more in terms of uh, what apprenticeships are about, uh, because I know that there are perhaps a couple of you that are interested in that route. Okay, Brilliant. but I will be here to answer any other questions. You're not going to worry, stay around, no, we've sure. still got time. <laughs> so if you, you've still got time for ask questions at pretty much any time, uh, and we've got, I've got, I'm looking out for that. So Christina is going to be talking more about the apprenticeship. There, there you are. It's great to have you with us back in the studio. We've done a lot of work before in the past in the, uh, the Granville Turner Studios. Tell us more about the apprenticeship side of what it is that Katerina has been talking about. Sure. So um, it's, it's quite a build up there, uh, which is fantastic. <laughs> and yes, Kat's right. Um, the, we were the first level seven apprenticeship provider uh, with systems engineering. Um, here at Cranfield, we do specialise um, in management and engineering as well as banking. Uh, we have quite a variety of apprenticeship programs that we now offer um, and we've had really great success rates um, with those. So I'm going to tell you more about um, the apprenticeships that we offer um, and what we have here at Cranfield. So we're really proud that we have over 1,200 apprentices um, currently registered and working on their apprenticeships here at Cranfield, um, supported by not only the course teams uh, and the teaching staff, but also apprenticeship tutors as well. <coughs> We've had really high success rates and so far we've had over 400, it's actually nearly 500, we've just had uh, more apprentices go through endpoint assessment and we currently have a 100% pass rate which is really, really exciting and 99% of our apprentices pass on their first attempt um, and, and really that is down to the fantastic course teams that we have and our apprenticeship tutors that are there to support and guide our apprentices and their employers um, throughout their apprenticeship programme, um, giving them that moral support. As we know, it is really hard taking on that full-time role and an apprenticeship at the same time. So you're taking on that part-time study and building a portfolio of evidence. Um, so as Kat alluded to, there is um, certain eligibility criteria um, the organisations have to be paying uh, either into the levy um, or be based in England um, and if they're not a levy payer possibly it, that would be unusual for, for the banking sector. Um, they, there is a co-investment option um, with the government. So the programme here um, as Kat said it is two years long and then we have um, space for the um, endpoint assessment. Um, sorry about the slides there, I accidentally clicked it uh, too quickly. Um, so we have time for endpoint assessment at the end and that is by an external body. So once you've completed your academic programme and you've gained the two awards that Kat talked about. So you actually, in fact, by the end of your apprenticeship and once you've successfully completed your endpoint assessment, you'll have three certificates. So for two years of work, uh, three qualifications um, that you can be proud of. So to be eligible for an apprenticeship, 
um, you have to have resided in the UK for three years prior to the start of the apprenticeship. So whether that's you're a UK citizen um, or whether you're from um, elsewhere in the world, you need to have resided here in the UK uh, for three years prior to that. Um, if you are here on a visa, a working visa, so it can't be a study visa, it has to be a working visa, and that visa needs to be longer than the duration of your apprenticeship, and we ask for six months extra. Um, so that is because if for any reason you might need to retake a module during your academic programme, um, or you might need to take a break during your apprenticeship programme, you've got that extra time. It means you've got time to complete your programme prior to um, either extending your visa um, or moving to another part of the world to work. Apprentices are required to spend a minimum of 20% of their contracted hours on their apprenticeship. So this is uh, the support uh, required from your employer. So as Kat said, some of that time will be spent here at Cranfield, whether that's virtually or face-to-face, -face, um, undertaking lectures. Other parts, or other uh, elements of that time might be doing some of your group project, working with your learning team, who will be your new best friends for the next two years of the programme for sure. Um, you might be doing um, assignment writing or learning something new. You might be in the workplace as well, putting into practice the knowledge, skills and behaviours that you've learnt in the classroom and your apprenticeship tutor will help you take that knowledge and transfer it into the workplace, how it's going to apply um, and then how you are evidencing those knowledge, skills and behaviours that you are learning into your portfolio. Apprentices um, must work a minimum of 50% of their time in England. So if you live on the borders, um, making sure that you are spending a minimum of 50% of your time in England. So that is a requirement by the Education and Skills Funding Agency. Um, you are also required to um, have maths and English at level two. So that's equivalent to GCSE grade C, or for some of those of you who might be a bit younger, a four or higher. Um, if you don't, for whatever reason, I mean, some of you might have been having a great time at school at 16 and GCSEs were the last thing on your mind, not a problem. We are here to support you um, in gaining suitable qualifications during your apprenticeship. If you studied your secondary education overseas, again, we're here to help. So these are not um, prerequisites to starting the course, but you would have to have them by the end of your apprenticeship programme. So the uh, Retail and Digital Banking Apprenticeship, um, you need to support from your employer. So I talked about the 20% um, of the job training. Um, you will also need a mentor um, in your place of work. So ideally that's somebody who is either very experienced, as Kat described, you know, some of you guys have been uh, in the banking sector for well over 20 years. Those sorts of people are ideal to support you in your apprenticeship. Or somebody who already has a level seven qualification. Um, they will help you um, apply the knowledge, skills and behaviours from the classroom into the workplace and identify opportunities um, for you to experience um, and apply your newfound skills. There is an initial assessment which uh, measures where you are at the start of your apprenticeship. So you're not going to be outstanding. We don't expect anybody to be a high flyer at the very start. The idea is that by the end of your apprenticeship, you have gained all the knowledge, skills and behaviours required by the apprenticeship standards. So you start off as a beginner, but you end up being the expert in the room. Um, and throughout your apprenticeship, we have what is called pro uh, progress reviews and tripartite reviews. And they are to ensure that you are progressing smoothly and gaining all of those knowledge, skills and behaviours required by your apprenticeship standard. Now I've talked a lot about the standards and you might want to find out more about that and what it entails. So there is a web link at the bottom of the slide there. Um, so if you click onto that and then you'll be able to, to find the further details. So the crucial bit of how to apply, this is what we really need to know. Um, so there's the two different options that Kat talked about. So we've got the apprenticeship, um, which I've just been describing, and then we've got the, the MSc, which you could do either as self-funded or as a sponsored student. So your employer might choose to pay outside of the apprenticeship levy for you to complete the course. Um, so there is two different application routes. So as a self-funded or sponsored student, you can apply directly to the university as an individual. So you would go for the um, screen that is on the right there. If you were to want to complete it as an apprenticeship or you have employees that you want to put forward, the first step is to complete what we call an expression of interest. 
Um, that helps us see which employers and how many uh, apprentices that you would want to send to us um, and to start that employer profile. So we have to get you registered on our systems and make sure that you're ready. We have all the details um, to enable you to then share the application link um, with those that you want to apply. So we'd send you an application link which your employer profile is set up with us um, and then you would share that with your employees to apply directly to us. We are here to help everybody through the application process. Um, we know that many of, um, as Kat said, 20% of our apprentices have never been to university before, so we know that it can be a bit of a daunting process, but we are here to help. We want you to have a great experience. There are deadlines uh, for these applications, so the ones on screen are specifically for the apprenticeship. Um, so employers would need to submit their expression of interest by the 11th of July, sorry the screen has gone quite small, uh, mm -hmm. and it's the 25th of July um, therefore applications from the individual apprentices. So they are the absolute deadlines, applying well before is very welcomed. Um, and Kat do you want to just share the application deadline for the self-funded and sponsored students? Um, so I think those details would be uh, on the website, but uh, normally we would say at least a month before the program yeah. starts. So, so that the program is starting on the, the 19th of, um, of September. Um, just a couple of things that I would also like to, to mention and perhaps you know, echo uh, Christina's uh, uh, words. One is that if you have any questions, uh, please get in touch, uh, you know, feel free to get in touch directly uh, with me if you have any questions about uh, the program uh, or uh, with Christina via the apprenticeships um, email that she has shared with you uh, as well. If you have any questions about apprenticeships, I think, you know, any of us will be very happy um, to, to to clarify, to answer any questions that you may have, because at the end of the day, I think you know the the, the cohort that then we will have, you know, the, the group of individuals that uh, uh, we have, we we find that it's it's very important that there is um, a very clear match. So um, you are doing the program that you want to do, and we have basically the learners that will f we feel will benefit from the program, will grow with the program and can also help others within the cohort grow. So, so it's really important to find that, that um, you know, good match. Uh, so anything that we can do to, to help you clarify any doubts that you may have about the program, feel free uh, and please do get uh, in touch. Um, also, uh, in terms of what Christina mentioned uh, with respect to the support, I think this is really important. I mean, over the years, I've been with Cranfield now for over 20 years. And, um, and you know, uh, as I mentioned uh, to all of you, uh, we deliver exclusively uh, postgraduate uh, qualifications and executive education. So we deal with executives on a daily basis and we know how busy everybody is. And so the level of support that we can provide you with is also very important. With respect to apprenticeships, um, everyone would have an apprenticeship tutor that can also support you throughout, uh, throughout the program. So you will be able to engage with faculty. We don't have, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, once a week um, hour where you can, um, come and, and, and visit faculty if you have any questions. No, we, we try and answer your questions and, uh, uh, and, and help you, you know, throughout the year whenever, uh, whenever is required. So we, have, we, we pride ourselves in having a very good relation with our, um, with our learners. In fact, I always say to, to my students that this is a mutual learning process. You learn from us, but we also learn so much from all the experiences that you share with us. So, um, so I think that's, you know, the, the level of support that you will have, it's, it's really important to emphasize that. Um, with respect to the in-company project, because I know there were a few questions mm -hmm. about that, Toby, um, you will also have um, a supervisor that will have regular meetings with you 
uh, to provide you with regular feedback on how to develop uh, the project. So you will have different levels of, of support throughout the program for sure. There is a question, I'm not sure, Christina, whether you have more, more slides or more information, so stick around, but there is, uh, Tina Shrukasha has a question around looking at entry requirements for degree. Would an individual with an M farm, a master's in pharmacy, mm -hmm. be able to apply for this degree? I'm not sure, Christina, that's something you can help us with. Um, so, as Kat said earlier, we do welcome applicants from um, a variety of different backgrounds and having an undergraduate degree in a relevant area isn't a necessity. Um, where you might not have an undergraduate degree um, or it's in a, a completely different area, we sometimes interview students um, as part of the admissions process. Uh, that sounds a bit scarier than it actually is. Um, you'd have an online interview with uh, Kat or one of her team. Um, so it is more of a, an informal discussion to find out what your experiences are um, and if you would be suitable for the course. And if it's felt that there's things to work on before entry, then those are offered to you um, at the time. So it, I'd say it's more of an enjoyable experience and it's less, much less formal than a job interview, for example. Mm. Cool. Uh, can I just add that, uh, so for instance, in that case, so the idea is really to also understand how has the individual's experience um, evolved over the years? What is the relevance of this program? Because someone may have done uh, an M farm, but uh, then went on to work in the banking industry or for a consultancy that actually serves certain banks. So that could be uh, the case. Um, and so, you know, um, people's lives, they have a lot of twists and turns, isn't it? So, so in many ways, you may have done a, a first degree, which still may provide you those analytical skills, uh, which are quite useful in terms of um, the mindset of doing a, a, a first degree and those, those, um, those skills that you may wish to develop with respect to, um, uh, to, to, to analyze different issues, uh, communication skills, the presentation skills, all those research skills. So it may not be um, uh, necessarily a first degree that you would think, oh, this is really relevant to this program. But actually, when you delve deeper, there may be elements of that degree that actually are useful. Um, but I would say in those cases also importantly is what has the individual done since, uh, since having that first degree? Uh, where does the individual want to go with a master's like this? Um, and so then we will work in with the individual and also as part of an interview to try and see, okay, finally, is this a, a good um, program for this individual? So I don't think that the fact that it's a completely different um, first degree from the area of banking, that, that should put people off. I've had people from, I mean, I have someone at the moment that did a first degree and master's in astrophysics. I've had people that have done undergraduate degrees in, in music, in journalism, in so many different areas. And I think that's part of the richness of, mm. of the variety of individuals that then you find that are employed in, in, in retail banking. Brilliant, thank you. We're running out of time, unfortunately, but <laughs> you've heard several, you've heard a lot of things here today, not least of which are some of those email addresses and some of those deadlines. So I guess the next action would be to please pay attention to those email addresses. There's several, there's Katarina's email address, there's Christina's email address, there's a general uh, apprenticeship email address, and there's a, even a school of management email address. So please, there's no excuses not to get in touch if you have any further questions, please do that. And as you can see on the screen right now, there are gonna be a few deadlines. You heard that from Christina as well. So please uh, make a note of what those are. This is not your last chance to have a conversation with us. Uh, so really, we, we'd love to have, a, have to carry on that conversation. Uh, thank you for joining us out of your busy day today. Apologies, we've had to run, finish this session. We could have gone on a lot longer. I just noticed a question from Sabella, which has come in. We'll get that back to you as soon as we can thereafter. So Katarina, thank you very much indeed for joining me. It's great to have you back in mm -hmm. the studio. And Christina, thank you for joining us too. It's fantastic to see you both. Uh, studio management today was by Marco Gomez. Exec producer was David Metcalf. My name is Toby Thompson. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Have a good day.